And I just want to say a very warm welcome to everybody in the house today. If this is your very first time here at our Clearwater location, I'd love it if you'd do one brave thing. Just give us a wave, lift your hand in the air, and shake it around like you just don't care. <laughs> welcome at the back over there. Welcome in the front over here. Welcome on the side. Our hosts are going to come around with a welcome card. And uh, we would love it if you would uh, fill that card in for us. You can pop that into the offering box basket, which will come around in a few moments. And uh, don't worry, all we're going to do with that information is send you an invitation to a meet the pastor's meal, a dinner with the pastors. That's Pastor Nick and myself. We are the senior pastors of City Life Church. We get to do, to do dinner together. And in that dinner, we get to talk about all the wonderful things that the Lord is doing at City Life Church across both our locations. We have a location here at Clearwater as well as at Lone Hill. And we'd love to get to know you and share all about what's happening at our City Life family, amen. And so you may have arrived as a visitor, but right here we are one big family and we pray that you would leave feeling just like part of our family, amen. Come on, let's give our visitors one more massive round of applause. You know, it's not often in life you get a, an ovation, <laughs> a round of applause, so that's cool. It's time for the offering. Woo! And I love it because we always cheer because the Bible says that the Lord loves a cheerful giver. And there's a very good reason why he loves a cheerful giver because he does not ever want us to give under compulsion. He wants you to give because you love. Love gives. Amen. How many of you know um, that when you love someone, I feel like I'm going to break into a Brian Adams song in a moment. When you love someone, <laughs> you want to go, you want to do everything you can to show them how much you love them. Amen. Pastor Nick and I just recently, last week, we celebrated our 22nd wedding anniversary. Yeah, we did. Uh-oh. I did that just so I could get a kiss. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> and you know, one thing I was thinking as we were reflecting back on all of our memories, you know those memories when we first started out and we sat on a cardboard box as a chair until we could afford a chair and how you build your lives together and it's absolutely wonderful. But I've never ever had to ask Nick to show me how much he loves me because it comes natural when you love someone. Amen. Yeah. Say so when you love someone. You give. And John 3.16, what does it tell us? Come on, there's a reason for the season coming up. Easter it says, for God so loved the world that he gave. Say gave. gave. He gave his one and only son. I want you to pick this up. He doesn't love the world so much that he's going to give. He loved the world so much that he has already given. He gave. Say gave. gave. God has already given you the biggest blessing of your life. His name is Jesus. And it's because we are in Christ that we have access to all of the provision and the blessings of the Lord. Amen. Come on, if you, if you believe that, let's get the Lord a round of applause right now. What I'm trying to say... <laughs> is that in the Old Testament, we, we had to do things where we had to first do something in order to get something. And I want you to know that the principle of sowing and reaping is why the world even exists today. It's biblical. When you sow, you will... Amen. So you will always get a, a reaping when there's a sowing. Amen. But how many of you know when you choose to love someone, when you choose to give, you don't have to get something in order to give. Amen. We don't give to God to get. We give to God because we got. Are you picking up what I'm putting down? Because he gave, he already gave his son. We are standing in righteousness and good standing with the Lord because of what he has done. And because we have Jesus, we have the victory. Say victory. Come on. I want you to know that <laughs> there is no deficit in the kingdom of God. The Lord doesn't sit trying to count the pennies and figure out how he's going to get you out of your hard circumstance. No, my Bible says he owns the cattle of a thousand hills, that the streets are paved with gold. This is the Lord we serve, the maker of heaven and earth. Do you believe that he can provide for you? 
Come on, has he already shown himself faithful in those areas of need? Come on, if he has, then give him a shout of praise in this place. I want you to know that we will have no deficit, no deficiency. And let me back this up with scripture. 2 Corinthians 9 verse 8 says, And God, say God. God. It's God who is able to do this. God is able to make all grace abound to you. What is grace? Come on, it's Jesus. And everything that Jesus represents, his grace will abound to you. His victory abounds to you. His blessings abound to you. He is able to make all grace abound to you so that you have all sufficiency. Say sufficiency. Sufficiency. Notice it doesn't say deficiency. It says that you will have all sufficiency. That means that you are going to have everything you need when you need it. Praise the Lord. And you're going to not just have all sufficiency. It says you will have all sufficiency in all things. Say all things. At all times. Say all times. That you may abound. Say abound. One of my favorite words in scripture because it just goes on and on. You will always not be without. You will always have. God will always give you grace. His grace knows no end. There is no way you could measure His grace and His love towards you. It is abounding. And the Bible just told us that He will promise you His grace will abound to you and you will have all sufficiency. Say all sufficiency. All all means in every area. That includes your finances. Amen. Amen. All sufficiency in all things, say all things, at all times, so that you may abound in every good work. How many of you know that the Lord doesn't want to get something from you? He wants to get something to you and through you for the benefit of His kingdom, so that all will glorify His name. And as you do that, as you sow, as you give, as you show Him how much you love and depend on Him in the area of your tithe, When you do that, he says, all sufficiency will abound. Say abound. Abound. All things, all the time. And that's a promise from your father. Come on, would you stand with me in this place? I want you to get the heart of God. He loves a cheerful giver because when we choose to give to him for who he is, it's worship. It's the highest praise. It's saying, God, you know, it does. I know in my circumstances it looks tough, but I know because I have you, I have all sufficiency abounding to me in all ways, in every way, all the time. Amen. So right now, I'd love it if you could decide in your heart what you feel you'd love to honor the Lord with today. Come on, we honor Him with our tithe. That's a tenth. You can honor Him over and above. <coughs> Whatever it is you decide, we're going to honor him in this place. And as the offering baskets come around, there'll be a snap scan and bank details on the screen. And we've got card facilities at Welcome Desk. However you want to do it, we want to make it possible for you to sow into the kingdom of God so that many other people can come to know him as their Lord and Savior. And so that you can add this to your act of worship to him. Come on, are you ready to give? Let's praise him as we do. Hey church and welcome, we're so glad you've joined us. This year we want to go deeper in devotion and grow more intimate with Jesus. Why not join us again this Tuesday, the 26th of March from 6 to 7 p.m. at our Lone Hill location for another power hour of prayer, worship and encounter. We do look forward to seeing you there and we hope that you'll make these Tuesday evenings part of your rhythm for the year. Absolutely, it's going to be so powerful. Hey church, the Easter weekend is upon us, just one week away. This is such a great time to invite someone to church, so why not go ahead and do that? Here are our Easter weekend encounter times. At Clearwater, encounters are at 9 a.m. for both the Good Friday and Easter Sunday encounters, and at Lone Hill, they're at 8.30 and 10.30 a.m. for both the Good Friday and Easter Sunday encounters on the 29th of March and the 31st of March, respectively. We can't wait to see you there. That's right. And church, we will be having water baptisms on Easter Sunday. That Sunday, the 31st of March, they will be taking place at our Lone Hill location directly after the second encounter. Easter Sunday is a great 
great yeah. day to get baptized and that's actually the day that I got baptized and it was truly special. Yeah. So we encourage you to do the same. If you'd like to get baptized, then you can put your name down at the welcome desk or send an email to info at citylifechurch.co.za. Well, we can't wait for our Thursday Grow Night. And here's Pastor Nick to tell us more about it. Hey, City Life Church, so glad that you are in the house this morning. You know, we live in a world where the Word of God is perpetually being questioned. It's being distorted. It's been under attack. People today live more in human wisdom opinion, human sentiment than actually living in the Word of God. And so you may remember that during our Vision Sunday, we mentioned that we would be launching some Grow Nights. Those Grow Nights are upon us. What an incredible opportunity for you and I to get a deep foundation in the fundamentals of our faith, our fundamentals of what the Word of God actually says on a topic, what we're going through or what's happening in our world. Hebrews 4 verse 12 says that the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. I want to tell you that the Word of God has the power to change everything. And when we base our lives not on good sentiment or the perceptions of what the world says or the narrative that the media says, but on the Word of God, the Word of God can never return void. It cannot fail. And I love that. Do, how many of you need to stand today on a promise on the Word of God? And so we're launching on April the 11th, our first Grow Night. It's going to be over the course of a number of weeks. And this first course we're doing is entitled Bible Doctrines, a great way to reaffirm your faith, reignite your faith, get back to some fundamentals of what we believe as the Church of Jesus Christ. And so I would encourage you, would you consider signing up today at our welcome desk? Would you consider putting your name down, sending an email to info at City Life Church? These nights are going to be absolutely phenomenal. You do not want to miss them. For more information, pop by the welcome desk after the encounter or email info at citylifechurch.co.za. Well, that's all the church news we have for today. Have a great encounter. A blessed Sunday. And we'll see you again next week. Fantastic. Well, welcome. So good to see Christian on the anchor slide there. Um, I think Christian is probably one of the most significant voices in our day and our age. A young man anointed by God, I'm yet to hear him preach in a word that isn't relevant, powerful, on point. And I want to encourage you, come on, get excited, come on, because Christian, he's at uh, Lone Hill today, but God is, has placed such an anointing on this young man. He has such a demand, um, even in the States, people are asking for him to come and preach and come and minister. And we have an absolute privilege in this house of getting to hear some of the best preachers on the planet. Come on. And then also me as well, but I'm not one of those ones. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Tell someone around you right now, you're at the right place at the right time. Come on. You may have got an email if you are on our database or it's in your spam folder, junk folder, something like that. Um, you may have got an email, just an update of what's happened at City Life Church. I want to tell you that this church, both here at Clearwater and Lone Hill, we are on the cutting edge of what God's doing in our nation. We're a church that's been praying for an end to load shedding. We're a church that every Tuesday we gather, we pray for our nation, we pray for the upcoming election. We're praying against the agenda of the enemy that would seek to divide, that would seek to make us believe that we are less than, that our future is not in God's hands, that it's in the hands of a politician. No, we worship, and this is an old saying, but a valid saying, the King of kings and lords of Lord, Lord of lords. He is ruler and authority over all. And I want to tell you in the book of Acts, he took leaders out who were not following what God wanted to do. Those leaders that would persecute the church, persecute believers, God is sovereign and God is control, in control. And when we begin to preach like that, the enemy, we become a target for the darts of the enemy. 
Because when the enemy sees what God is doing, when Jesus, when you book, read in the book of Revelation, when Jesus in his early years, the devil tried to take him out there, and then at the peak of his ministry, the devil tried to take him out there, right? I want to tell you that this church is a growing church. This church is a significant church, and the enemy is trying to make us believe that this church is less than. I want to tell you, this church here at Clearwater is going places. Come on. We have one of the best locations. I want to tell you that about 100 other churches who would do anything to have the opportunity to sit in Clearwater Mall come on, in a place where they can bring friends, bring family, in an air-conditioned environment, praise the Lord that we have air con, come on, 34 degrees today, people, just a heads up, um, I might sweat, but it's not because of just the heat, it's because the heat of the word that I'm going to bring today, come on, fantastic, but we are blessed and highly favored, and that means that the devil will try and stop what we're doing, we sang a song today, let the devil know not today, we're not going to take his rubbish. We're not going to take that which he throws at it. And you know how you come back at the devil? Not by shouting at the devil, but actually by worshiping our God. Being part of what God is doing, you know. And so uh, literally a week ago, we had someone uh, come and steal from the Lone Hill location. They stole a number of pieces of critical uh, audio, visual equipment, cameras, all of that. Something in the region of about half a bar. That's a significant amount of money, I want to tell you. And uh, during uh, January, and we've been going through different cost-saving exercises because we really want to put the resource that we have into things that are growing the church. We had to uh, remove some items of cover that the premiums were just totally out of hand. And so that which was stolen, I want to tell you, was not undercover. But that doesn't perturb us. It doesn't freak me out because I know God is good. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Lord lifts up his standard. God is faithful. We've already been able to, with the help of Amanda, who's been an absolute uh, uh, champion in this, uh, in this what's happened at Lone Hill. She was there the day it happened. She was there um, a few days later as well, and just her whole team have just been absolutely incredible, been uh, by our side and uh, helped us navigate so that at least last week, Sunday, um, we could get some, some kind of set up going. I had to be there last Sunday because I needed to tell that congregation what had happened to their equipment, our equipment, and uh, bring a, a word of encouragement in that. But I want to ask you, your prayer is powerful. What's happening in this time? We're praying less. We're believing less. We're worshiping less. God says, do not let those fundamental things go. The prayer of faith is powerful and effective. When you pray, things happen. When you ask God, things shift. It may not always be visible in the natural, but in the spiritual realm, we wage not against people. We've chosen that those who have perpetrated this against the church, we release them. We forgive them. We pray for their salvation. Many of us, anger comes up. No, we're not angry people. We model what Christ did on the cross. Forgive them for they know not what they do. They will come to know the Lord Jesus. They will become born again believers in Jesus' name. Come on. And actually that which is stolen, we place it in the Lord's hand and we release it as seed. What does that mean? It's actually in the hands of the Lord. Because we can ask for it back, trust for it back, go on a witch hunt for the equipment. No, we release it as seed because that which is in the Lord's hand will return 30, 60, and 100 fold. Come on. And so we've been asking our Lone Hill family, I'm going to put it out here as well, if you want to make a contribution, sow a seed uh, into the, re the replacement of that equipment, pray about it, seek the Lord. Maybe you're saying, you know what, it's the middle of the month, I ain't got nothing right now. Well, maybe you can go and uh, pray about it and make a pledge that when the resource comes in, this is what uh, my family are going to do in order to set that church up to win. Amen. Father, we thank you even right now that we come against every assignment, every attack. We know that the church is under attack. 
Believers are under attack. That it's felt, Lord, even right now, for many people in this room, like it's a flood water. That sinking feeling, the inability to breathe, the feeling of a panic attack. But I thank you, Lord, we are not going to panic. We are not those people. We're going to stand on your word. We believe you are who you say you are, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you can do above what we could ask or think or imagine, Lord. We release those perpetrators. We thank you for their salvation. We release the equipment as seed, and we thank you, God, that this will return to us with even better equipment in the name of Jesus. Come on. Can we give the Lord just one last shout of praise? Come on. I've entitled my message today. I really want to get into the word um, because there's something on today's word. I've entitled my message today, A Change of Residence. Come on. A change of residence. If you're writing notes, a change of residence. I had some other titles. I've moved, maybe. Uh, the bolt has bolted. Um, don't be green about my green pasture. That was a good one. I don't know why I didn't get any response about that. But don't be green about my green pastures. Come on. Don't be jealous. Come on. Um, I've settled with my Savior. There were a lot of titles. But I went with a change of residence. Anyone ever moved house? Come on. Anyone ever gone through the rigmarole? They say that moving house is one of the most stressful things that you can do in your house. But I want to tell you, spiritually, you and I have actually relocated. We used to be in darkness, now we're in light. We used to be in the world system, and now we represent God's system. That's what the Bible says. If you've got a Bible here today, why don't you just lift it up? If you've got a good old school paper Bible, I see one at the back. Anyone else? Anyone following on an electronic device? Come on, wave it in the air. Come on. Fantastic. I want to encourage you, especially those who have a paper Bible. Those that are sitting around, that is where the anointing is. That is where the presence of God. Come on. Uh, fantastic. Well, church, as we get into the Word today, I want to remind you that it said that expectation is the breeding ground of the miraculous. Well, let me help you. Hunger is the landing strip of the Holy Spirit. And my prayer today is that God will anoint this word. This word will come to life and it'll actually hit home. It's a passage that many of us may have read before. It comes from the book of Colossians chapter 3 from verse 1 to 4. It will be up on the screen. There is a QR code if you want to follow along uh, in BibleGateway.com. It says this, follow along, fill in the blanks. Since then, you have been raised with, set your hearts on things where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things, not on earthly things, for you and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with Him in glory. This topic of a change of residence, we need to understand that Paul, the author of the book of Colossians, is writing to the church in Colossae. Colossae was about 160 kilometers away from Ephesus where he wrote the book of Ephesians to the church there. And this was a community or a group of people that were originally pagans. They were originally idol worshipers and God had stepped in and they got radically saved. Come on. Anyone remember getting radically saved in Jesus? Come on. They had had this complete turnaround, but the church right now, because of the influence of the environment in which they found themselves, that actually many of them were relapsing, going back into things that God had brought them out of. Past thinking, past perceptions, past mindsets, past mentalities, and they were going back to what the Lord had delivered them. Maybe sometimes the reason we're tempted to fall back to where you were is because you don't understand in Christ right now where you are. See, the Bible doesn't say that we will be raised. Yes, there is a time where Jesus returns and we're going to be raised. But actually in your spirit person, we're spirit 
soul and body, the Bible says when you received Christ, you have already been raised. You are not where you were. You see, you don't have a revelation of your relocation. We are not where we were. We're not into things that we were part of. Why? Because we're not down there. God has said we're actually positioned up here. See, I want to bring clarity of where you are so you won't relapse to where you were. I have an assignment today, church. My assignment today is that through the subtle voice of the enemy, he's trying to get you to go back to thoughts, back to things, back to places, back to people that actually have no place or position or authority in your life, and they will never get you to where God's about to lead you. Come on. See, I'm here on assignment to actually silence the voice of that lying devil who would make you believe that you're less than, make you perceive right now that where you are, you're never going to have what you used to have. No, I'm here to tell some people that in a year of open doors, and I felt that this month, there are people here that actually even in the physical realm, you're moving house. You're about to upgrade. God says that actually in this year, there are people here that are going to relocate homes, better areas, better neighbors. Come on. If you're believing that, would you give us a wave? Come on. In Jesus' name. God does not take you into old things. Only you can take you back into old things. Come on. God has changed your residence so you don't need to relapse. Come on. When I read this passage, there are three themes that come through. The first one is seek. The set second one is seated. And the third word is set. We see this in this passage in Colossians. Seek, seat, and set. And each one of these words actually represent a position that you and I have in Christ. The word seek speaks about our pursuits. The word seat speaks about our position, and the word set actually speaks into this thing of, of what we prioritize. You see, Paul uses these three words because he wants you to understand that where you are is not where you were. We're positioned differently in Christ. Since you and I came to know him and we've changed residence, our pursuits have changed. The pursuit of endless wealth, happiness, social media influence, all these things. While all of them are not wrong, that cannot be the ultimate purpose of my life here on planet Earth. Come on. My position has changed. My priorities have changed. That's why you can give yourselves a hand today because you're seated in the house of God this morning. Come on. Understand that you've changed your residence. You've been raised with Christ You've been raised is actually a very interesting term. If I said to you, you've been raised, he's not talking about just you're sitting down and now you're standing up. The word raised actually means you've been raised from the dead. Dead living, dead lifestyle, dead things. You were dead. Why? Because the wages of sin, the Bible says, is death. Romans 6 verse 3 to 5 says this. Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? If you've gone through the waters of baptism... As a New Testament believer, you died. When you go into the water, it's the death. It's identifying with Christ who died. In other words, my old way of thinking, my old lifestyle, who I was, is left in death. And then when you come out of the water, which represents cleaning, cleansing, a new start, a new life, you have been raised with Christ in God. It's a beautiful picture I would encourage you, if you're a believer and you haven't been baptized, this is your next step. Come on. Easter Sunday, I want to encourage you. Pop through. Get, we'll, we'll be there. We'll get a crowd there behind you to celebrate you going through the waters of baptism. Verse 4, we were buried with him through baptism into death. Just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of our Father, we may too have a new life. For it was to be to united with him in death like this, we will certainly also be united with him in resurrection like his. That's very important. See, it's not just what Christ 
did for us. But the cross is a picture of what Christ did as us. See, in other words, we died with Christ. We were buried with Christ through baptism. And as we come up out of the water, there is new life which you are presently in. The devil wants to make you believe you're not in a new life. Things are not new. It's kesera, sera. Whatever will be, will be. Old things. No, God says old things have passed away and behold, the new thing has come. One change in our mindset can activate a totally different perspective on the present predicament you're in right now. Come on. See, you died. Romans 6 verse 6 to 7 says this. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that our bodily ruled by sin might be a done away with. That we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. I'm here to tell someone here today that you've been set free from sin. Sin has no power over you. Sin has no dominion. Oh, my parents did this. It's part of our family line. I'm just going back. No, God says in him, I have cut that out of you. See, the devil thought and tricked you into thinking that the devil's power is stronger than God's power. I'm here to rectify that today. No, you're no longer a slave to sin. You're no longer chained by sin. You're not going to be a bound believer at City Life Church. No, I've taken up a new residence in Christ Jesus. You've been relocated. Hell has to let you go in Jesus' name. Galatians 2 verse 20, it says, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. See, you thought that the greatest threat over you, in you, and around you was the devil. I want to say today that it's actually the biggest obstacle this morning is actually you. I believe that self can be a greater adversity than Satan. How many of you know that Jesus said, take up your cross? Did he say this? Deny the devil, take up your cross and follow me? No, he didn't. He said, deny what? Yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. That's why today we need a revelation that actually our old mindset, our old thinking is that which can hold us back today. Come on. Deny yourself and take up the cross. We need to deny and, and let go of some self things. Hello. Some self-righteousness. No, that's not who I am in Christ. Some self-pity. Some of us, I know what it's like to go through hell. Hello. Bianca and I have been through one of the most crazy, uh, uh, we're just giving you a blimp on the radar of some of the things that have happened to us or our family in this recent season. And it's very easy to operate in self-pity, but Jesus says, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. Hello. Why am I following? Because he's got something better. Or do you want to camp out there? Come on. Self-promotion. Hello. Selfishness. Come on. We live in a world, oh, that man there, he's a self-made millionaire. Well, the last thing I I checked was that same millionaire is breathing air that God actually provided him walking on a planet accessing resources that Psalm 24 says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness of there is no self in the future that God has for you come on they may think out there, this is, oh, he's a self-made. No, God has allowed. Why? Because the reign of the Lord falls on the righteous and the unrighteous. Come on. As long as you are self-centered, you cannot be Christ-focused. As long as it's all about me right now, I cannot be Christ-focused. We've relocated. We've died to sin, died to self, died to the world system, and anyone Today, I want to ask you, have you changed residence in this house today? Have you moved? Are you in a different place? Whether you know it or not, give us an amen today. I need Carlo, why don't you come forward? See, the Bible says in Colossians 3 verse 3, For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. That's interesting. Carlo, why don't you come to the side? This is you, people. Would you hold this up over here? There we go. The Bible says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. That means when you and I got saved, Christ came into you. Would you put Christ in the envelope for me? Oh, there we 
There we go. The Bible says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. That scripture in Colossians 3, it says now that actually your life is hidden with Christ. In other words, that Christ came into you, Christ in you, but you are also in Christ. Would you put you into Christ? But then the Bible says that Christ is the fullness of of God and Christ is found. You are hidden with Christ in God, which means actually Christ is in God. Hello, where are you? <laughs> Christ in you, you are in Christ and Christ is in God. That's why we need a revelation that when Adam had sinned, he covered himself with fig leaves. Let me help you. When you have a revelation of what the devil has to get through to get to you, you would understand of the magnitude that you are not where you were. You're not where you were. Your greatest enemy is not the devil because he has to go through God, Christ, and Christ in you to get to you. The greatest enemy we face is our own perception of the salvation that I have died, I have been raised again, I am risen with Christ in God. Just give it up for Carla. Thank you. Greater. <laughs> That's why we can say, greater is he that is in me than he who's in the world. That's why we can say, if God is for me, who can be against me? Because I'm hidden with Christ in God. I have taken up a new residence. Some of us need to realize, hey, quit looking for me past. I'm hidden in him. Quit looking for me condemnation. I'm not where I was. I am now in him. How many verses speak about what it means to be in Christ? In Him we live, in Him we move, in Him we have our being. Why would we move? Because you're not where you were. You've taken up new residence. What does it mean? In Him we live, we move, and we have our being. What is being? Everything that He has created for me to become in Him. Hello. You see, in Him I have everything, but outside of Christ I have. We need a revelation today. That in Him, I have all I need. Are you ready for this? Ephesians 1 verse 7 says that I am redeemed in Him. In 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21, it says I am the righteousness of God in Him. In Romans 8 verse 1, it says there is no therefore no condemnation for those in Him. In Colossians 2 verse 10, it says I am complete in Him. In Ephesians 1 verse 4, it says I am chosen in Him. In Ephesians 1 verse 6, it says I am accepted in Him. In Ephesians 1 verse Verse 3, it says, I am blessed in Him, blessed in my coming in, blessed in my going out. In Ephesians 1 verse 13, it says, I have been sealed by the Holy Spirit, where? In, in Him. We need a revelation today. Something happens when we let go of a mindset that says, I'm just down here. God says, oh, there's so much more. See, I wouldn't want us to stop too long, but I also want us to focus on this passage. It says, Ephesians 1 verse 13, I've been sealed in the Holy Spirit in Him. Let's look at it on the screen. And you were also included where? In Christ, when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in Him with a seal. There's that verse 13. The promise of the Holy Spirit. What? Verse 14. What does that mean? Who is a deposit? The Holy Spirit is a deposit here on the earth. What does it do? It guarantees our inheritance. What is our inheritance? The provision as being a child of God. Not one day when we get to heaven, but heaven's reality here on earth. Do you see what I'm saying? Who was a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of His glory. You see, the Bible actually says that the Holy Spirit has become a seal guaranteeing a position that we have in Him. You see, this is actually a real estate term. Have we got any estate agents in the house today? Any, any estate agents? None today. Come on. 
Okay. <laughs> but it's actually a real estate term which speaks of a term called earnest money. In other words, if I see a property, it's a time of the Bible when this was written, I see a property that I want. Other people are also interested in that property. I put down earnest money. In other words, I put down a deposit guaranteeing that I have that until I come back again and pay the full amount and take with me that which belongs to me. No one else has authority. No one else has jurisdiction. No devil in hell has a word when God says, I have given earnest money for you. Well, I read in my Bible, come on, that one day that eastern sky is going to open up and Jesus is coming down with heavenly armies and you and I he'll come down and say that's mine she's mine he's mine they're mine and we will be raised into the sky to meet with our Savior come on because he has given the Holy Spirit as a guarantee now when you read this passage what would happen in biblical times is when a contract was signed, I'll just put a cool gold sticker here, but what would happen in biblical times is they would take wax and they would seal the promise with wax. They would use a signet ring. If you were someone high up, if you were a king, a ruler, someone in authority, you would have a signet ring which had a coat of arms that bared a mark of that which you represented and they would delve into the hot wax and leave a permanent seal. Now for you and I, anyone ever missed out on some post? <laughs> anyone still using the post office just by show of hands? Come on. Anyone think, gee, I need to send my friend this uh, uh, brand new case of money. Uh, let me go to the post office and I will send it by the post office to Cape Town or somewhere overseas, right? How many of you know that even sometimes things that we get in the mail could be takealot.com, right? They have no understanding of what was in that box. Whether you're getting a whole bunch of sunlight washing liquid in a box or you're getting a brand new MacBook computer, the delivery person has no comprehension of what's in the box. So if he kicks the sunlight soap, he could kick the MacBook Pro, if you know what I'm putting down this morning. You see, there's no understanding of what's in the box. But God says, I have given the Holy Spirit as a seal for you. In other words, God says in their postal system, I have placed a mark. When someone in, in Jewish culture in the time of Christ saw a piece of mail that had a stamp, had a signet, they realized that this was no ordinary mail. This was nothing ordinary. In other words, when I see that seal, it means this is very important. If I get this wrong, I'm going to end up losing my life because of the power and the authority of that which the seal represents on this envelope. In other words, I don't care what I have to go over. I don't care what I have to go under. I don't care what I have to get around. This will get to its destination because of what it represents. God says, I haven't put that mandate on a man who can fail. I've placed that mandate on my Holy Spirit as a guarantee guarantee that the good work, Ephesians, uh, Ephesians uh, blah, 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 Philippians 1 verse 6, that the good work he has started in you, he is faithful to complete. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God says, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, to give you a hope, to give you a future. I have placed my seal that no man can break. I have given the authority of my name and put in your position the Holy Spirit as a guarantee that that mail will end up in a place that I have destined it to. Can we give the Lord a shout of praise? Come on. Woo. I want to speak to someone today that's felt hindered. I want to speak to someone that's felt this morning that you've been set back, that you're not going to get there. Maybe you've been battling in your finances, your marriage. I want to declare today the guarantee of the Holy Spirit says you're going to get there. 
Your marriage is going to get there. Your finances are going to get there. I've followed a package before, destined for South Africa. And I want to tell you, they sent it on the wrong conveyor belt. It went to the wrong location. It went via Hong Kong. It went via Japan, via uh, Amsterdam. But it got to where it was destined to go. Some of you feel like, I am so far gone. You are not far gone. Because the Holy Spirit is the guarantee that your kids are going to get there, that your finances are going to get there. Come on, church. Tell someone around you, I'm going to get there. Come on. I'm going to get there. Woo. Gabriel, you can come up. I might cry at times, but I'm going to get there. I might get emotional. I might have a fit of carnality. I may operate in the flesh. I may get angry, but actually I'm going to get there. I may need to come into church sometimes and say, I'm not going to be a spectator. I'm actually just going to offer a, a shout of praise because I'm going to get there. I may need to offer that praise. I may need to offer a prayer, but I am going to get there. The opposition will not stop me. Criticism won't hinder me. I'm sealed because I am no longer a resident of there. I am seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. I am not where I was. We need a revelation of our relocation of where Christ has positioned us. See, the last thing I want us to realize, the Bible says that you have been raised with Christ in God. Ephesians 2, 6. I've been raised with Christ in God. Where has Christ been raised to? Well, the Bible tells us that Christ has been raised far above every power, every authority, and He is seated at the right hand heavenly father and God says to you today you have been raised high and far above powers and principalities not just above depression far above depression not just above poverty high above far above not just above the poverty line oppression fear come on no he has positioned you with Christ far above every power and principality. You see, Jesus is seated right now. But so often when things go wrong, we feel that I've got to stand. I've got to do this. God, I've got to, I've got to make a plan. You see, when you stand, what are you relying on? You're standing on your legs. You're standing on your energy. You're standing right now. Some of you are so burnt out, you're looking for a chair regularly because you've been standing on that which you thought would support you. God says today, it's time to sit down. When you stand up, you're relying on your strength. When you sit down, you're leaning on His strength with a revelation of faith that says, I am seated with Christ in the heavenly places. See, some of us would not be so upset if you learned how to sit down. I'm so upset with my boss. Sit down. I'm so upset with the politics of how nations sit down. I'm so, so upset about ESCOM load shedding. I'm so upset. Sit down. Come on. You wouldn't stay upset if you learned to sit down in His presence. You've been raised, have been raised with Christ. And it's, you are hidden with Christ in God. Christ in you, the hope of glory. You are in Christ and Christ is in God. sit down 
I take up the battle. The battle is not yours. The battle is the Lord. Come on. Church, we need a revelation. You are not where you were. Christ didn't just do what he did for you. He did what he did as you. To give you a new location. Far above powers and principalities. You have been hidden with Christ in God. The devil has to come through a lot to get to you. The battle today is actually yourself. The Lord would say you need to let go of your own thinking on this thing, your own carnality, your own limitation, your own mindset, your own toxic thinking, your clinging to past behavior that many believe, oh, I'm chained to. No, God says I have freed you from the curse of sin. I have broken the chains of sin off your life. You're a new creation. And when you stop getting upset, when you sit down, I will make your enemies your footstool. Father, right now, to me. It's all about me. I've got to make it happen. No, we will be seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. In other words, we will lean not on our own understanding. We will trust in the Lord with all of our hearts. But my head gets in the way, God. Well, God, well, you are, you're all powerful. Why don't you step in, God? You could change this. Why don't you? I will lean not on my the limitations of my own thinking because my thoughts are not your thoughts because your ways are not my ways. But when I accept you in my heart, I let my thoughts come second to that. That says, you know what? I've made a decision in my heart that Jesus is the one I stand on. Jesus is the one I've been raised with. Jesus is the one I look to. I cannot go to my thoughts because my thinking will let me down. But I know God has come through for me before. For those who have suffered spiritual amnesia, wake up today. He has done a miracle before in your life. He is still a miracle working God. He will still do a miracle in your life. Stop letting your thoughts get in the way of a hard decision, of a hard trust, of a hard decision. Slay me yet will I trust you. I will not bow down. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego on the fire. Even if my God doesn't come through me, what did they say there? And they went against their thinking and they believed in their heart and there was another in the fire. Some of you, the reason the other hasn't come in the fire is you're still rationalizing with the limitations of your thoughts, of thoughts that are not good of God. God says, would you trust me in your heart? Because I'm about to release a miracle. I'm about to bring your breakthrough. I'm about to bring the change that you've been looking for. Will you humble yourself? Will you pray? Will you seek me? Will you trust me? Will you go through the fiery furnace? Will you go through the storm? Will you go through the valley of the shadow of death? Because I'm about to break out green pastures. God said, no, even when you are unfaithful, I am faithful. 
I've cut covenant with the Holy Spirit and He's about to get you where you need to go. Being confident. Confident isn't a head decision. Confident is a heart decision of this very thing. That He who began a good work in you, He's about to get you through. He's taking you through the forest, over the mountain, through the valley, round the stream, through the river, through the Red Sea. He's about to part seas, move mountains. He will get you where you need to be. Would you trust Him today? Would you trust Him today? If you're not right with God, 
I want you just to lift your hand up so I can include you in my prayer. Thank you at the back there. Thank you, this lady at the front there. Thank you, sir, on the side there. Can I ask you just to lift your hand up? Cheryl, there's a lady here. There's two. Thank you. In the middle here. Someone's getting just a card and a Bible. But right now, forget about that. If you lifted your hand, I want you to say this prayer with us, those four people. Say this, Lord Jesus, I come before you today and I ask you, Lord, to come into my life. I choose you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Forgive me of my sins as I forgive myself. I walk free. I walk in new life. I choose to follow you all the days of my life from this day forward. I will trust you even when it doesn't make sense. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we give those four people a round of applause? Church, I want to encourage you. I know many people travel from Santon. They can pop through to Lone Hill for the prayer meeting. If you can't make it, would you commit as a family, spend 10 minutes as a family on a Tuesday to come together as a family and pray and say, you know what, we couldn't make it to the prayer meeting. But our family and our home, we're going to pray. As a couple, we're going to pray. As an individual, God, I'm setting aside this time because there's other people in my church family that are praying for me. I'm going to pray in this time. Come on. And then I want to ask you, let's not be flaky when it comes to church. We're entering and we have entered one of the most significant seasons. I'm not talking conspiracy theories. I'm talking about the shaking of the church. I'm talking about the persistent attack of culture on the things that God has put in place. You will come through it. You're gonna be strong. You're gonna be blessed to be a blessing, but you need to plug into what God's doing. And so I wanna pray right now. Father, I thank you for the beautiful people of City Life Church. That Father, in the day and week ahead, you will bless them to be a blessing. That Father, whatever attack would come, it would fall down to the wayside. We do not need to come up with a a defense. We don't need to come up and use words. No, God says, I will fight this battle on your behalf. We need only to worship. When we're driving in our car and it's chaos, we're going to put on a song of praise. We're going to trust you, God, that we will prosper as the people of City Life Church and be in health even as our soul prospers. In Jesus' name, if you believe that, can we give the Lord one last shout of praise? God bless you. See you next week, Sunday. Cool. Fantastic. God bless you as you go.